Thanks very much. Is it true I've got five minutes less or a little bit more? No, no, we're running very late. Okay. Um, I suppose I should start off with an apology, shouldn't I, for um, choosing this particular title. Um, but it, it just seemed to me that um, words are quite important. And I suppose all I, what I want to do this morning, this afternoon, um, is to talk about the words that we use for uh, 3D vision and how they're misused um, and uh, that's, that's the, 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 there's going to be no data it's just going to be about the ideas and the concepts and the words themselves words are important I think <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I, and I use this um, uh, this picture in the in the first slide. Um, this is actually a, um, a, a, a drawing by Rubens, um, which is one of a number of drawings which were contained in a lovely book by Aguilonius back in 1613, um, his um, uh, sixth book, uh, a book of the optics. Um, and uh, it, we discovered this book, um, Ian Howard and I, when we were. Um, uh, writing our book on binocular stereopsis um, in the Bodleian Library. Um, no one had actually come across this before and we'd, we'd, we spent a long time trying to find a copy of it and then we finally went to the Bodleian Library and they had two copies of course. <laughs> uh, we weren't allowed to touch them because they were so rare and so on and so forth but we did manage to get some, um, some copies of the, um, of the uh, Rubens illustrations and this particular one is rather nice and, and in some sense is relevant to the talk because it depicts this um, man who is um, blind in one eye trying to make a judgment about absolute distance. This is very relevant to your talk uh, and, and obviously failing to do so. Okay, so uh, that, that's the justification for the first slide. Um, let's try and uh, clarify the situation. The problem of 3D vision. Uh, it's often claimed, uh, and you'll find this in most of the textbooks, it, in a way I should add that this talk is more directed, critical of us as psychophysicists, I think, than it is of the, um, um, uh, of the uh, machine vision community. Uh, but you'll see in many psychological textbooks, perceptual textbooks, the claim that um, there's a particular problem of 3D vision, and that problem arises from the fact that the retinal image is only two-dimensional. Uh, and I just picked out a couple of examples. Luckily, Mike, Mark Georgeson isn't here, but from a very nice book by uh, Bruce Green and Georgeson, uh, they write, um, I hope you might be able to see it, although curved, the image is essentially two-dimensional, and yet our perception of, uh, uh, is of a 3D world. How, mi how might depth be recovered? So that tone of, we've got a particular problem. Um, here's a second example from Levine's um, Fundamentals of Sensation and Perception, where he wrote, writes in the, you see, in the first few words of the chapter on 3D vision, on depth perception, uh, he writes, how does stimulation of a two-dimensional retina, retinal surfaces get translated by your brain into perceptions of depth or distance? Uh, you know, brains don't do translation, but uh, again, it's the same issue about uh, there's a special problem with 3D vision. Uh, it, it, it's not new. Um, uh, one can go back to Al Haytham's book in, uh, of the optics in um, uh, the 11th century, where um, he wrote, um, sight does not perceive distance namely the distance or remoteness of a visible object from the eye by pure sensation. So those ideas of there being a special problem somehow or other um, and it's to do with the retinal image being only two-dimensional. What I want to argue and I'll try and justify it in a moment is that the dimensionality of the retina is totally and utterly irrelevant. A similar idea was put forward by the philosopher Berkeley um, uh, in 1709 in Towards the New Theory of Vision, where he argued that there was no information from a single viewing position or vantage point, if you want to use uh, that word. And uh, here it is from the first page of his New Theory of Vision. Um, and again, I'll read it out. It is, I think, agreed by all that distance of itself and immediately cannot be seen. Sorry, Paul, or oh, perhaps that's in agreement with you. For distance being a line directed endwise to the eye, it projects to only one point of the thumb, which remains in, um, in um, uh, the same whether the distance be longer or shorter. So that was Berkeley. 
Um, but notice if you look carefully at what he said, it's actually nothing to do with the retinal image. What he's essentially saying is you lose information about distance from a single viewing position. So uh, I, I'm tried to depict it by saying, uh, by putting this little uh, cylinder there, if you like. And his point is simply that if you have the two points which lie along the same line of sight, then from a single vantage point, there is absolutely no information about their distances. There can't be. And in a way, you don't need to worry about the eye. You can get rid of the eye. It's nothing to do with the eye and the retinal image at all. The limitation is that from a single vantage point, that distance information is essentially lost. But, of course, um, it also shows us how we can recover it if we want to recover uh, certainly absolute distance. And that is, we can have two vantage points because then simple geometry tells you that you can say something about the distance of those two points. Or the third solution, which um, uh, Paul also alluded to, is that if we have a changing vantage point, then the change in the angular positions uh, again, forget the eyes altogether, nothing to do with eyes, nothing to do with the retinal image. Um, as soon as you have a changing vantage point, then those changes of the angles, in principle, in principle, I stress, can tell us information about absolute distance. But, and there's always a but, this is for a world of points. We don't live in a world of points. We live in a world of surfaces, and that makes a huge difference. And I think any analysis based on simple points is, again, very misleading. Of course, we can actually look at what is available in a point world. And I'm going to generalize that as a criticism of using random dot patterns, actually, in the sense that, again, they're very artificial, and they probably don't tell us very much about 3D vision. So, to my mind, the input for, uh, for perception is not the, the retinal image, it's but the available information, and I'll try and justice, uh, justify that. Um, the American psychologist James Gibson famously claimed that the retinal image is irrelevant, uh, is not necessary for vision. And when you tell that, or when students first read that statement, they think this man must be completely off his trolley, or whatever words you want to say. How could you have vision without a retinal image? Um, and of course, you know, it's a lovely catchphrase, uh, and what it's of course saying is not that you don't need a retinal image in order to perceive as a human observer, but the characteristics of the retinal image are actually irrelevant. And indeed, uh, what's interesting is that often, again in the psychological literature, the view of someone like Gibson is contrasted with the view of Helmholtz, and Gibson perhaps as a, as a, um, um, uh, as a direct theorist and Helmholtz as a, as a constructivist. But in fact, 150 years ago, Helmholtz made almost exactly the same statement. He said, I am myself disposed to think that neither the size, the form, and position of the real retina, nor the distortions of the image projected on it, matter at all. In the natural consciousness of the spectator, the retina has no existence whatsoever. And um, perhaps this is being a little bit unfair, but I uh, contrast that view with my former supervisor, indeed close colleague and friend, uh, Richard Gregory, who in 1966, um, in Eye and Brain, started off the whole book with this statement, we are given tiny, distorted, upside down images in the eye, and we see separate solid objects in surrounding space. This is nothing short of a miracle. You see, the emphasis is on the characteristics of the retinal image. And I would agree with Gibson that those characteristics are essentially irrelevant. You see, philosophers have been telling us for several hundred years it doesn't matter that the retinal image is upside down and people wonder why do we see the world the right way up. It's, it's not a picture, the retinal image, which is seen by anybody. We have to extract information from that particular sense organ that we happen to have. And likewise, it does not matter that images are tiny on the retina. What, is that, what has that got to do with it? Or whether they're distorted. If we have a visual system which actually 
um, takes the patterns of light and dark. The whole purpose is to extract information. Um, yes, the retinal image is not a picture that we see in any sense, and it's very easy to fall into that trap, I think. Here I'm going <laughs> to disagree with James, perhaps, and, and Paul indirectly. Um, we have particular words to talk about 3D vision, and the particular words are cues and clues. And if one takes a, de a, dif a, a dictionary definition of the words cue and clue, it's all about insufficiency or ambiguity. We only have a clue as to uh, a certain property. We haven't got certainty. Um, or indeed that uh, those, those cues and clues might be ambiguous. Those are the words which it's so difficult to escape from, I find. I mean, uh, you know, we talk about the stereoscopic cues, um, which have that, uh, 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 that, that, that connotation. And that idea, I think, is typically supported by demonstrations like the Ames Room on the left, or the Shape from Shading, um, or the Ittleson and Kilpatrick playing cards. What we say, what will the textbook say, which is complete and utter nonsense, is that in the Ames Room, uh, there's, an, uh, there's an ambiguity because um, although this room is actually a trapezoidal room, we see it as a rectangular room, and indeed there's an infinity of equivalent configurations which can produce all the exactly the same image. <gasps> We're faced with a tremendous problem of actually knowing or whatever, being able to perceive uh, that particular room. Or in the case of which we've, uh, we, um, uh, James already alluded to, of a, a shape from shape then, um, uh, you know, that particular pattern of light and dark could have been created by um, those craters on the moon lit from um, above, or they could, be, um, uh, uh, they could be bumps which are lit from below. Oh gosh, what do we do? We have to make an assumption about the direction of lighting. Or the Ittleson and Kilpatrick, I'm sure everyone's familiar with this, that in their experiment they had playing cards, so in some sense we know the size of playing cards, and set them up so that actually what you perceive is uh, a depth order which is exactly the opposite to the actual depth order. Oh my gosh, that's the visual system making mistakes again. Um, if you look at these, I haven't got time to go into it, each of them in detail, um, you know, they do not show uh, what we, um, uh, 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 what the, what people often claim for them. And again, I think it's worth bearing in mind that we don't talk about cues for colour. Um, you know, somehow or other, colour information is just there. We've got a trichromatic system, we have three different sorts of, uh, of, uh, of receptors in the retina and so on. We, we don't, it doesn't have that same connotation. We just see colour directly, completely unlike 3D vision. And, of course, one of the justifications for talking about these as cue-like is the need for assumptions. Uh, whatever assumptions are. Um, to my mind, assumptions, you see, this is why words are so important. Of course we make assumptions as cognitive beings, but do we make assumptions as perceiving individuals? And I would argue, no, we don't. Assumptions, to my mind, are simply the properties of the world that form part of the mechanisms of our evolved visual systems. And none of us would want to argue that flies make assumptions. You see, it's the wrong word to my mind. Okay, primary and secondary cues. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, uh, secondary cues often referred to as pictorial cues. Um, I've looked through Helmholtz, perhaps someone can help me, but I'm, I don't think he actually talked about primary and secondary as such. He talked about vergence and accommodation as being related to the uh, to, to the motor system rather than the visual image, but also the, one of the cues that's labelled as primary is binocular disparity. That's an image cue and in a sense is no different in that sense from perspective or the other cues. It's, uh, that distinction between the two I think is, is a very meaningless distinction. Is there any evidence that, well, yeah, Paul's answered this in a way, is there any evidence that binocular stereopsis, virgin state, or accommodation are primary? 
what does primary mean? Does it mean in terms of the computational theory they're, they're more reliable because they're direct or something from the motor system? Uh, or is it in terms of their effectiveness? And I think Paul told us very nicely that, in fact, all the evidence in terms of virgin state and accommodation is certainly not that they are particularly primary. Or, to take the opposite, that perspective, occlusion and shape from shading are in some sense secondary. Um, uh, lots of modelling by lots of people, good modelling over the last uh, 20 odd years, has talked about uh, the different weights that cues might have. Um, well, there are, there are several problems there. I mean, one is that I personally reject the whole idea of looking at perception, or 3D vision in particular, um, of these different sources of information in isolation. That certainly tells us what might be sufficient, but it doesn't tell us necessarily about um, whether they're necessary. And moreover, it sort of ignores the fact that we've evolved in a 3D world with all of these things present and together. And the idea that we have these separate little modules to analyze these things separately, and then we have to put them back together again, seems to me to be false. Um, and likewise, yes, we can, we can do nice experiments where we pit one cue against another, disparity versus texture gradient, and so on and so forth. And we can produce different weights to, give, uh, to explain the answer. I, to my mind, weights are simply a redescription of what happens in a particular situation. They're not really an explanation. Um, and on the contrary, it seems to me that demonstrations like reverse perspectives, which most of you will know about, I'll show in a moment, show that actually pr uh, perspective is quite a primary cue, if you want to use those words. Um, this is my own um, uh, um, Patrick Hughes um, reverse perspective that I have at home. I've taken a bleak view of it because instead of being a flat painting, the thing about Patrick Hughes reverse perspectives are that they're three-dimensional structures which come out towards you. And you can see that by the end one, it's, it's a pyramid, a truncated pyramid, and that's true of all of those. So when you're looking at those, from uh, straight on rather than uh, obliquely like this, um, what do you see? Well, if you stay still uh, and you're at a reasonable distance, or, uh, essentially you've got two sources of information. You've got the binocular disparities and you've got the perspective information. Well, which wins out? So this is a slightly different one, but that's as if you are looking at it straight ahead. Instead of getting you all to move backwards and forwards, I'll rotate it for you, I hope. Ah, uh, where's it gone? Ah, it's failed. It worked perfectly before. Okay. Don't, don't yeah, press it, it the second time, just press it once. It, it was working. Was it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, no. yeah. Just, just press it once. Just press, press once. Ah, okay. oh, thank you, thank you. Oh, it doesn't change on my screen. Yeah. <laughs> ah, right, okay. And of course, what you see is that these pieces appear to be much closer to you, that's much further away, even though actually, well, this is a picture rather than the real reverse perspective, but um, in, in experiments, unless you're very close to reverse perspective, perspective overwhelmingly dominates. Finally, do we need to buy 3D TVs in order to see the 3D structure and layout of scenes? Um, well, it's interesting, isn't it? They became in vogue a few, five years ago, seven years ago, None of the major manufacturers manufacture them anymore, no one wants one. Um, what they do, of course, is to provide binocular disparities. But, of course, the question to ask is that uh, ordinary TVs, um, it's, not, it's, not the, uh, it's not the absence of 3D information that's present, that's important, but rather the presence of the contradictory information. And what I always recommend to students is look at a TV, particularly if it's of a nice, um, uh, you know, um, 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 natural scene um, with one eye rather than another, and particularly if the, if the camera is moving, you get a much more vivid impression with one eye. It's the conflicting information, which I think Dan Raj would have talked about if he had been here. It's the conflicting information that's actually um, uh, preventing you seeing the 3D. So, uh, just to conclude, 
I would want to argue provocatively that there's no particular problem of 3D vision. Uh, I put this in deliberately. Of course, the input for most machine vision systems is a 2D image, but it seems it's a, to my mind it's a mistake to assume that because the image is 2D, that there's no information about a 3D structure of the depicted scene. You know, where would you put motion parallax or the kinetic depth effect? You know, that's regarded as a secondary cue or whatever. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's in the 2D image, if you like, um, uh, but there is information there. The important task in my mind is to identify the available information, including the constraints. You see, there's another word. You might, when you're building machine vision system, have to build in constraints. I don't see that, uh, and assumptions about our visual system, but it seems to me that constraints and assumptions are the wrong words to use when we've got an evolved system. Once we, and here's the final point, actually. Once we've uh, identified what is the actual available information, then we actually have a description, in my mind, of how the system is working. They're two sides of the same coin. So, thank you very much.